TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Hi, I'm Lauren Bissell, and you're listening to Pretend, a stories about real people pretending to be someone else. And today you're hearing the voice of someone else. I'm not Javier, but I'm here to interview him because he's made 100 episodes of Pretend, and that's a lot. So we're going to sit down together and go over the past 100 episodes together episode by ep- no i'm just kidding we <laughs> it's are gonna just- be a really long show <laughs> <laughs> we're just gonna talk about what he's learned some favorite moments and kind of just celebrate the last 100 episodes so hi javier welcome to your show <laughs> lauren thank you you know when when i started realizing that i was going to Creeping up to 100 episodes, I, a lot of shows have 100 episodes or more, a lot of episodes. But for me, 100 episodes is a lot. It's like, that's 100 little documentaries that I've been able to produce within four and a half years, which is, it floored me. And so I thought, well, that's a big catalog of work to talk about. And who, who can I invite on my show that could really dig into the library? And, and so I thought of somebody, Lauren, who is like a podcast encyclopedia. She, I mean, you should check out her newsletter. I'll have a link in the show notes. It, it is fabulous. If you want to discover podcasts, Lauren has it. So thank you, thank you for saying that because my newsletter takes me forever and sometimes I wonder, why do I do this? But it's because I think we need more help discovering shows like Pretend, like that aren't, for some reason, aren't on the Apple Podcast app every time I open up the Apple Podcast app. It's too, too many shows that aren't don't get enough attention. And But I've, I've learned about so many good shows just off of your newsletter. And I know newsletter, it sounds like an old way of communication, but it is awesome. It is such a good newsletter. So Well, what's funny is that I have a newsletter about podcasts. So it's like old fashioned media talking about old fashioned media, like radio, you know, who would have ever thought that my two favorite things would come together like that. But Lauren, when, when I was in college, I, I studied journalism. And so you had to decide uh, the, the first year you had to decide what kind of journalism you wanted to do. You know, you, you could be in radio, you could be in TV, you could be whatever. Right. And I remember walking down the hallways and all these people were saying, oh yeah, I'm going to major in radio. And I go, radio, radio is dead. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I, I literally laughed at them because I thought that was career suicide. And look at me now, I'm doing radio. Wow. Do you know- if podcast any- didn't exist back then. Yeah. Do you wish you had chosen radio or do you think that you have like kind of an edge because you're doing things in a totally different way than the old way? No, no, I I come from a video background. I chose broadcast journalism. So on the air, I was with working news, local news, documentaries for a local PBS station. And so when I came up with the idea for Pretend, what my intention was not to do a radio show or a podcast, it was to do documentaries. I wanted to go out and shoot documentaries. But if I would have gone that route, I mean, shooting a documentary requires cameras, lights, audio and and a lot of people and it's just it's overly complicated but then at that podcast it just it unshackles all those restraints right so you could just do a, a hundred documentaries like i have in a short amount of time and i i mean if i go back and i tell javier from back then from four and a half years ago that a hundred documentaries you know four and a half years later i would never even realize that could be possible that's amazing way to think of it. 100 documentaries. But when you started it, did you think you would even get to 100 or did you have a smaller goal? No. In fact, I remember having this conversation with my wife because, you know, I started this podcast and it was all with borrowed equipment. I was using my job's camera or microphone and editing and all that stuff. And I, I told my wife, I was like, you know, this might, I might 
do another season or something like that. She's like, do another season and then we'll talk about buying a microphone. <laughs> and so, well, because, well, you know, it's a hobby. It's true, yeah. I mean, I can tell you uh, like a dozen other hobbies that I started and yeah, never yeah. finished, you know, and I, I was with her. I was like, yeah, I don't want to buy like a really expensive microphone yeah. if this thing is just a phase. But after four and a half years, or, <laughs> I don't think it's a phase anymore. I think I think officially, yes. Once you hit the 100 mark, you should get some sort of award, I think. Yeah. And it's not only 100 episodes of pretend. I have like dozens of other uh, criminal conduct, which is kind That's, of an accomplishment, too. So it's nuts. I just learned about that myself. Yeah. I can't believe I am supposed to know about all of the shows and I did not know about criminal conduct. I can't believe it. It, it, it is. I'm a, the master of under the radar podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I must say when I first discovered your show, I had, and we can talk about how I did in a second, because I'm not quite sure, but I had a moment of fear because the first thing I listened to was so good. I thought, how can this go on forever? Do you know what I mean? I felt like it was so special. And, and I kind of also thought, could you have, uh, lots of ongoing episodes about pretending, you know, it seemed so specific. And yeah. did you think you could, are you going to run? You have to make me feel better. Are you going and say, no, are you going to run out of people that pretend to Ugh. that people pretend? You just hit a nerve because <laughs> this is, I ask myself this question all the time, like after every season, you know, especially after season three with the word of faith fellowship, I, I go, how can I top this? I don't know. Yeah. And there's no more pretend angles I could cover, but yet I keep finding other ways to explore the same topic. Yes. And I think that's what I love about the show. And I hope that the people listening, that that's what they get out of it too. Sometimes I get emails like, Hey, where's the pretend angle in this story? And sometimes oh. the pretend angles could be a little, little hook, right? To get you into the story, but it all has a pretend angle somehow, or at least for me, it does. Sometimes it's really obvious. Sometimes it's not, but I I don't think I've run out of uh, story ideas yet, at at least. No. And you keep on surprising us, honestly. And if you run out of episodes, I really don't think you are, but I just mean it was a fear that I had because this is such Mm -hmm. a specific idea, but when you think about it, it really isn't. It's a universal idea. But if you run out of episodes, you could do an episode on this episode where I'm pretending to be you. Just (laughs) There you go. (laughs) The first episode that pulled me in was The Cousins. Oh, that's that's one of my favorites. I'm trying to go back and figure out how I found it. Someone wrote about it or suggested it or something like that. And that is one of the wildest story. I don't want to, I'm not going to, no spoilers. I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but it's layers and layers and layers of wildness. It would be wild if four of the layers were taken off, (laughs) but (laughs) how did you stumble upon that story? And without spoiling anything about it, maybe it's impossible. Yeah. I'm trying to remember how I think that the author wrote to me or I covered um, an author in a previous episode and he's like, Hey, I think you might like this story. It was one of those. And I get a lot of pitches from authors. And and so that's tough because you have to read the whole book and what Mm -hmm. if it sucks? You know, I've had that happen. And this book, this was just like, Unbelievable. I mean, like you said, if you removed half of the crazy stuff, it would still be crazy. It's the most bonkers episode I've ever worked on. And I, funny enough, I, I, I think it's probably my best episode. And how do you top that? Well, I'm working on a story right now. It's a stalker story. I've been investigating it for like six months now. And I purposely haven't released it because it's ongoing. It's still happening. And it's equally as bonkers, if not more. I mean, it's nuts. Well, it is. Wow. I can't wait for that. And I hope that everyone listening is either thinking, oh, yeah, I really love the cousins and go re-listen to it. I just re-listened to it last week. And uh, it is the first thing that I give people when I recommend your show. So if you're listening to this right now and you haven't listened to The Cousins, you have to go listen now. You're in for such a treat. Yeah, go listen to it. Seriously. And then also buy the book that's based off the episode. I I talk to Susan all the time, by the way, almost on a daily basis. uh, The lady, she is so smart. And I I just 
I love the way she tells a story. And, and for some reason, sometimes you interview people and you, and sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't get it. Susan really gets it. And so when I met Susan, and I'm not spoiling anything for anybody who hasn't listened to it, but I said, I really want you to tell the story as it's happening, not recalling what happened, but take us there, like present. This is happening right now. And, and she took us, the listeners, and me on this journey with her as she was being tormented by the stalker. Yeah. And I think that's what made the episode great. And plus there's this huge cliffhanger at the end of part one. And this is, this is the kind of episode that I get emails about because they're like, I figured it out. I figured it out. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, good. I actually dropped that hint on purpose so that you can figure it out so that you want to listen to the next one, you know? So yes. it's a cool episode. I Definitely mean- one of my most popular for sure. Well, I also just the storytelling and the story is wild for sure, but the storytelling, yes, that is actually what makes it fantastic. And if someone else had done that same crazy story, it would not have been like that. And I think you're right. Like, because there's so many layers and the, giving her that advice to just take you through it, I think is the only way you could have told it successfully. Mm-hmm. Um, like, how do you, you're very good at interviewing people, obviously, like how, do you do good interviews? What are the secrets? And if there's people listening that want to, you know, have interviews on their own podcasts, like what advice do you have for people that want to do good interviews like me right now? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it takes a lot of preparation. I have gone into interviews cold without any preparation at all. And it's good, actually. There's a there's value into going to an interview cold because you're, you're asking questions questions from this ignorant point of view where you know nothing about the story. And so it actually helps you be a good interviewer because you're asking really basic questions that if you knew a lot about the story, you might just kind of glaze through the, you know, those details. But so there's value into that. But most of the time I read an entire book. I talk to you know, five or 10 different people trying to get the truth out of everybody because the truth lies somewhere in between. But before I call anybody, I have like an interview doc and I've heard some of my mentors or they're not mentors. They don't know who I am, but like people who produce Radio Lab, people who produce This American Life, that they all prepare an interview doc. And that is so important because my questions are in the store, in the, in the order that the story will take place. I mean, I kind of eyeball it. So it's basically an outline of the episode before I ever recorded the interview. And so now I'm able to capture the information in the way that the story is going to flow. Right. I think, I mean, it's interesting to hear that because you can tell when you're listening, but I did not know that you did that. But I feel like a lot of true crime podcasts are people reading off Wikipedia pages or something like that. You're making documentaries as we talked about before. Yeah. There's a lot of responsibility that I put on myself because I mean, I'm an amateur journalist. I'm not a professional journalist because I don't get paid to do that for a living. I used to, but I'm just, I consider myself a sleuth, right? And, but I I just have these standards for myself that I don't want to just put out one interview telling one person's story, although I do that sometimes, but it's corroborated by different sources. But I, I like to interview multiple people to get that same story because I feel like if I don't do that, I'm, just put polluting the world with false information. And I, I don't want to contribute to all the, the fake news that's going on. Right? But uh, I, I do think that's what a lot of true crime shows are doing. And I think I used to think I didn't like true crime because there is so much bad true crime and pretend was probably one of the first true crime shows I started listening to. And I would tell myself, Oh, but pretend's not true crime, but it is. Right. But it's so good. It feels so rich. It feels like I would first maybe describe it as a storytelling, an investigative journalism Mm -hmm. show that happens to be true crime. But I actually do love true crime now. But what do? How much of it do you think of as true crime when you first describe it? Is that the first word you use to describe it? That's the way I market it because I think that that's what what people like. If you see my show on Twitter, on Facebook or wherever, it's going to be a true crime podcast about con artists. But really what the show is about, it's like you said, it's an investigative journalism show that, that has this 
tilt or this leaning towards crime. And for me, it's, it's really more about deception than actual crime, you know? So yeah. some, some pretending is not a crime. And so I would say that maybe 50, 50, half my show is crime. Half my show yeah. is just deception. Well, it's about people, right? Isn't it all about people? You're probably right. learning a lot about people. And it probably is a reflection of the fact that I'm not that into true crime. So That's I don't like funny. I don't like the murders and the bloody stuff. I, I, I will do that. In fact, I am doing that right now. I interviewed a mass murderer on New Year's Day. Did I tell you this? No. Some consider him a serial killer. And that's to be debated, you know, like what you consider, because the definition of a serial killer is so vague. But yeah, on New Year's Day, all of a sudden I get this message on Facebook and it was a friend of mine said, hey, I could get you an interview with that mass murderer that you covered in season two. And I'm like, oh my God, yeah. And so he has a cell phone in his jail cell what? And he's been calling me like I've spoken to him like three or three nights this week. And it's been jaw dropping. I and what? I know, but I won't do I won't do murders all the time. But this guy is a con artist first and a murderer second, you know? So there's always that pretend angle there. Wow. Okay. So he is not allowed to be talking to you, right? Oh no, no. He <laughs> you get in trouble for talking to him? Well, he could get in trouble for talking yeah. to me. I'm not oh going to get in trouble God. talking to him. Does he sound, how does he, what's the tone? What's the vibe? Very, it's just like when you imagine a serial killer or a psychopath or any, any person like that, you, you get this overblown narcissism, this like, mm incredible pride for every, you know, who who they are and how important they are and like uh, very little remorse um, you know even though he says I'm really sorry for what I've done but you don't really believe it you know it's like almost like I have to say I'm sorry for what I've done and that was a tough interview because and that goes to the heart of like if I'm interviewing a con artist or if I'm interviewing this guy who's like this killer or if I'm it, interviewing anybody, I have to turn off my Javier, basically, and all my opinions and start looking at the world from their point of view. And then you can have a conversation because otherwise you start the conversation and they are on the defensive and then you can't get anywhere past that. So it took me three nights to get him to talk in detail about why and how he killed certain people. And that's not the point of my show. I don't like blood and guts, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I've wondered for years, I've covered this guy before. I wondered for years, why hasn't he, why did he do it? And I was able to get that, but it took me building that relationship with him over the course of several days to get there. Wow. Is, and this will be on the pretend. It's going to be on pretend and criminal conduct. I can, it's okay. definitely one of those stories that it's like, wow, this has been promoted to criminal conduct because it's more of a s multiple mm -hmm. episode type of thing. So I didn't want to junk up pretend speed, but I, I will play it on pretend. It's a story I covered Jolly Rogers Social Club. I don't know if any of you guys have heard it. It's like deep in the catalog. I had to re-listen to it. I never listened to my podcast, but I listened to it just in preparation for this interview because I had very little time to prep for it. So, and wow. it, it's wild. Did he ask you about you or does he only want to talk about himself? No, I don't think he asked me one single question about me. He, yeah, it, it's all about him. Yeah. And then, and, and the arrogance and uh, I, we could make a whole episode on just talking about this guy, but yeah, I really there's a lot to unpack there. A lot. Are you taking notes or like, are you recording the, the like, how are you documenting this? Yeah, I'm recording it. And actually, I prepped just like you asked me, how do you prepare, prepare for an interview? I prepared an interview doc, just like I always do, but just in a very compressed amount of time, <laughs> like right. in hours versus, you know, days. Wow. That yeah. was a, I feel like that was a bomb drop on this episode. Ooh, I just, about that. <laughs> just that, dropped that the bomb. Is, that's huge <laughs> news. That's, that's nuts. Um, well, that, well, that goes back to what you were asking me earlier, because prior to New Year's Day, you know, I took the, the holiday break off and, you know, I was having that crisis of like, what, 
what am I going to do? You know, like what's next? And can I, you know, and then all of a sudden, boom, this wow. <laughs> bomb drops. Yeah. Well, that's the sign you need that you are doing the right thing. So I'm going to go back a little bit. Well, first of all, which episode do you tell people to listen to? I tell people the cousins. Is that well, where you send people? That's my personal favorite. And that, like, that's the dark era of pretend that season. I forget. I think it was season four. I'm not sure. But that there were some really dark episodes like <gasps> back to back. There was the cousins and the prank series. The prank super, series. Super dark. I personally love those episodes. They're just so unique. And so I tell people those, but if I were the Rolling Stones, my satisfaction is the Word of Faith Fellowship. I mean, that's yeah. the, the one that, that's what people know me about. Like I went to the um, True Crime Podcast Festival in Chicago and I set up a booth and they're like, Word of Faith, Word of Faith, Word of Faith. I mean, that's why, that's how people discovered my show. That was my first episode. I turned that into an entire season and mm-hmm. And I am very proud of that. That was to date the most terrifying thing I've ever done and and the most well-received shows wow. that I've ever been a part of. Have you ever thought about revisiting it in some way? Yeah, like- actually. So recently I did an episode and, and this is good because, you know, people listen to podcasts sporadically, especially my show. It's not one that you have to start from the beginning and listen to all of them. You know, you listen to whatever interests you. And so a lot of people may not know that, but I actually did a follow-up. Re- and that one was a year's worth of recordings because it all takes place during COVID. And right in 2020, when things were going nuts, and there was, at one point, there was suspicion that Word of Faith Fellowship was a super spreader event, you know, like their services and stuff like that. And we were following up with some of the, the former members. And it's a really actually a very interesting episode, one that I didn't know how it was going to turn out, but it actually turned out pretty good. And you're doing, when you say we. Oh, <laughs> Did I say we? I say that all the time. It's no, it sounds like a lot of many, many people would have to do all this, but it's all you. I don't want to say it's all me because, you know, I have had Logan and Molly edit my show. They're really good friends of mine. They don't edit all the shows, but they've edited a lot of the shows. So they, they do a lot of the work, but essentially it really is just me, you know, doing the research, the reporting the writing, you know, that's, that's where the secret sauce happens It's yeah. in, the, in that process. And I'm so grateful for their help, but yeah, I, I, I dream to have like a team, to have a, we, I would love to have a, we, you know, where I could bounce yeah. off ideas. That'd be great. I mean, I, I think every podcaster I have ever met wears at least 10 hats and I'm not even, I mean, it just, it is, I think to be a podcaster, you have to be able to do a lot of different things more, more so than in other fields. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's different than like broadcast journalism? Like how is, how is podcasting different than broadcast journalism? Hmm. That's a good question. I think with broadcast journalism, you have more safety nets and more, more, more eyeballs on, mm-hmm. on the work, you know? So w- when we would produce a story for, and in a very condensed period of time, right? So we would leave the station at nine o'clock in the morning and we would have a story to chase and we would get the interviews and write the script and edit it and broadcast it by five o'clock. I mean, that was every day, rinse and repeat, right? And, but even within that process, you have producers who are looking at the work, you have your news director who's reading it and approving it and giving you feedback, even within that short amount of time. Uh, and then it's over, you know, and then you move on and do it again the next day. And in that regards, the, the, the agility and the speed, that's the same, right? In podcasting, but in, for an indie podcaster, you don't have those, that contribution from people looking and giving you feedback, which I wish we did. But I would imagine at Gimlet and yeah. other, other networks, Wondery, they have lots of eyeballs on the script and lots of feedback. And I'm sure the process takes a lot longer, you know? Yeah. I, I feel like anytime I've ever done anything, made anything, created anything, I crave feedback. Do you get feedback before you put out an episode or do you want feedback? Like, what is that? Yeah. Like, is there a voice in your head? Uh, I do. Wondering- I actually, you know, I, I have a Patreon channel and obviously that's a way to support 
financially support the show, but actually for me, the real benefit, other than you know people helping me financially put this thing together, is that I get to release the episode be- before it goes on the the main feed. And lots of times I get feedback. Like last night, I released an episode and I got feedback. So um, sometimes people will be like, "Hey, you know, at a minute and fifty five seconds, you repeated the same thing." I'm like, "Oops." <gasps> so like Patreon for me is it's it's very raw you know like i put i put the first draft up on patreon and i'm getting feedback i'm last night i i got feedback like hey that was really good that episode and and i really like this part and i'm like okay that's validation that i did it right you know so oh my god good and bad feedback that i think that's a really good tip for podcasters i've never i never would have thought of that that your patreon could be your guinea pigs and they're the that people so who appreciate your show the most so yeah. i mean i'm not looking for technical feedback but if there is a mistake that's a great place to run it and just i mean you know if if i make a mistake with my biggest fans they're probably a little bit more forgiving and and then i could give them the real episode you know what i mean like they, they're more but you know when you put it out into the world and millions of people are listening to your mistakes that's kind of embarrassing I never thought about that with your with your patreon audience that's so mm-hmm. nice uh um do you have fans like what Talk about your relationship with your fans. Do you feel like they know you very well? Do you know them very well? Like, what is well, it like? I, I mean, gosh, I love my listeners. I, I really do. I bet every podcaster would say that. And, and I'm no different. But I think, especially my Patreon supporters, I, I know them by name because they they not just inter- they don't interact with me just once by becoming a Patreon. Like once they're a Patreon supporter, they're messaging me, telling me, you know, this and that, or you know, we're we're just I don't know. There's, there's a sense of community, which is really nice. Um, so I love them. And I think they're very faithful, even though I'm not at this blockbuster podcast, you know, there are bigger podcasts out there. I'm not one of them. I just feel like the fact that I'm so grateful that, you know, I could, there's like an arena full of people that listen to me every time I drop an episode and that, that is so cool. If you imagine it that way and they're always there, they always listen to it. And yeah. it's so I don't know. It's very, it's very touching for sure to, to yeah. know that that the time and work that I put into something that people actually appreciate it. You know? And that there's only so many hours in a day and there's so many more podcasts than there were when you launched. Right. But so the fact that they're giving me an hour of their day is awesome. Can you talk about the last? So it's been like almost five years. Is almost. It? Yeah. In what? the summer, it's going to be five years. That's a hundred thousand years in podcast time. I know. Yeah. So how has it changed? I am dying to hear about this. Well, it's interesting because I when I got into podcasting, it was 10 years after podcasting um was invented, you know. I think. Or well, 12, 12 years. Podcasting started like around 2005. I started around 2017. But anyway, so the point is that I thought that the window was closed by the time I entered the game. I was like, Eh, I'm just another podcast in this sea of millions of podcasts. And I was wrong. I, I just slipped through that window as it was closing. I think a podcaster who's trying to do an independent podcast today ha- is going to have such a harder time than I did back in 2015 because um, it's just not possible anymore. It's just you're, you're going to get drowned out by the noise. Yeah. Do you have a lot of the of a lot of your listeners who have been around for four and a half or five years or? Yeah, a lot of them, you know, a lot of them, they come in waves. Ever have like a big episode. So like the word of faith brought in this wave of new listeners and then like the cousins, I, I could tell that there was like a big spike around that time. And, and some listeners, and I did this too, when I'm listening to podcasts and you probably do it as well, is that you really love a podcast and then you don't listen to it for a while because you wait for it to like build up so that you could binge it and go back and just binge yeah. it, the whole thing. So I do that too with my podcast. So I think people come and go, which I think yeah. is cool too. Wait, what, what podcast do you love? Can you give me one podcast that you love that no one knows about or not enough people know about and one podcast that you mm-hmm. love that everybody else loves too? Okay. Well, cool. Let me <laughs> let me look because um, the the one that you threw a curveball, the like a podcast that I love that nobody knows about. That that's going to be the tricky one because it's probably going to be like an indie podcast. So right now, I can just tell you right off the bat, dialogue. 
with Rebecca Sebastian. I don't know if you know Rebecca. She's so talented, so good, and so undiscovered. I cannot wait for her to blow up. And she just covers really interesting true crime cases. But the ones that got me into podcasting is definitely Criminal, which I actually don't listen to anymore. And not not for any specific reason. Like, I'll go back to it maybe one day. But This American Life and Radio Lab, those are the guys that I've modeled my show after. And I'll always listen to them. Yeah, so. it's funny. The, the reason I asked you this was because someone just asked me those two questions. And I love those questions. But I said This American Life for the one that everyone listens to, because I think people, everyone's not everyone, but we, lots of people started with This American Life. And then a lot of other shiny stuff comes and you kind of forget that it's there. But it's been there the whole it's, time. Waiting and it's for still you. good. It's still really good. I listen to This American Life every single week and I love dialogue. I am very, oh, really? very new to me. And she did an interview with the host of a, po- a show called Believe Her, which is a true mm. crime podcast that mm-hmm. I really, really liked. So I was really impressed with that. This was like three weeks ago. I have been a three week long fan of Rebecca. So I can't wait. Oh, to that's so cool. I'm meeting with her this afternoon. So how have you changed as a podcaster in 100 episodes personally? Well, somebody asked me this and it was through text. So I wasn't sure about tone and the tone got lost, but they were, they asked me in like a very excited way, like, how has the podcast changed you? And I said, well, it's made me a lot more cynical, less trustworthy, more, more private. (laughs) And he's like, oh, okay. (laughs) You know, like, I guess it wasn't expecting a negative answer, but it has, it really has changed me. Um, where I don't like to post personal things anymore. Um, sorry, that's my dog. She has like a like an itch in her ear or something, Aww. and she keeps shaking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's made me a lot more cynical about the world, and I don't know. But and then on the positive side, it's also I don't know. I feel like my delivery has gotten better, and I'm more comfortable being in front of a camera or being in front of a microphone, whereas I hated doing that when I first started. And also I I just feel like it's made me more curious about the world where I'm not a curious person by nature. I know that you're listening to this and you're thinking, yeah, you are because of the topics that you explore or whatever, but there could be an elephant marching down the road and I will drive past it and (laughs) I wouldn't even notice it, you know, but now I've become more observant, which is not a natural thing for me. Gosh, it's so, it it shocked me to hear you say you're more cynical, but It seems obvious too. Like, I think I forget which episode it was, but I, you had me convinced by the end of the episode that everyone in the world could access my social security number in one (laughs) second flat. And I'm sure that that's true, but I can't, yeah, I can't imagine not feeling that way after getting. So you probably have very long conversations with these experts and people that have you doubting yourself. Oh, yeah. Is there like a certain theme of pretender that makes you the most uncomfortable? Well, I mean, to jump on the first part of what you were talking about, that the, the whole identity theft thing, that's probably when I talk about being cynical and like less trustworthy and stuff, that's probably where it all stems from because I've just combed through the dark web for long enough and seen so many confidential documents that it just makes you sick to your stomach knowing that you're that vulnerable. Right. So I think that's where that stems from. Like, I just like, cause there's certain themes and pretend, you know, like Mm -hmm. which one is there one that makes you more uncomfortable than others? No, that's a good question. All of it really makes me uncomfortable in terms of, I don't like people who take advantage of other people. I think that's like the little vigilante part of me that, um, that I have when, when it comes to pretend where it really bothers me to see somebody being taken advantage of. Yeah. Um, Those are the ones that bother me. Like when they prey on the elderly or somebody who's disadvantaged or or the people that do some sort of con where they don't think that they're affecting uh, an individual, they're going after a company or whatever, but they're really actually affecting a lot of people. I I think con artists are more dangerous than serial killers. So you're listening to all these true crime podcasts and you're in shock when you hear about like Ted Bundy or whatever, but 
um, when you read about Bernie Madoff, he had way more victims, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like way more victims and, and, and affected a lot more lives, you know, than a serial killer. A con artist, they, they seem like we call it white collar crime and it almost minimizes the impact of their destruction. You know, they're just yeah. as dangerous. Do you think that we spend too much time worrying and talking about serial killers and not enough time worrying and talking about con artists? I think that we, we are fascinated by those that we don't understand. And I think serial killers stand out on a league of their own because they, they are so unlike us, right? Humans, no matter who you are, no matter who you hate, they have a heart, they have a conscience, but these guys don't. And so I think that we're just amazed by that. And we just want to understand how somebody could be so cold, Right. Con artists have those qualities too, except it's not as brazen and it's not as graphic. But I do feel like in a, in a way, that's why when I interview this killer or when I've ever covered a killer, it's I'm looking at it from the point of view that killers are just in the extreme end of con artists. Like con, there are, I'm about to do an episode right now on the different types of cons, I, almost like a list of all the different types of cons. There's not one type of con. There's a spectrum of cons. And serial killers are on the very far end of the extreme. This is a little bit of a tangent, but is there anything you're afraid of? Like, what's your, do you have a, a phobia? Yes. And I think that I'm afraid of a lot of things. And I think that the difference between me and a lot of people is that usually when you're afraid of something, you stop. <laughs> but uh -oh. I have this like, weird compulsion where I just keep going, you know? So even though I'm afraid, I keep going. If it's my safety, you know, like for criminal conduct, we went after the sheriff of St. Augustine and we told him that we were coming to town and we're like, Hey, you know, we better drive the speed limit and we better not have a crap in our windshield because we are like target. Yeah. We're going after this guy. He knows it. And, <gasps> and that was terrifying. But then once we got to know him and talk to him, things quiet down, but that initial fear that, that that's usually a good indication that you're doing something right. Cause that's tension, right? And as a storyteller, you need tension. And I, I make sure that all my episodes have some sort of tension where it makes you a little uncomfortable. Yeah. Because if you, if, if that tension weren't there, I don't think the episode would be as good. Oh my gosh. I thought you were going to say like spiders and you're like, oh, no, oh. actually going and investigating. Well, no, I mean, uh, fear. <laughs> no, but that's a good, that's a true fear. Well, but uh, non-podcasting fear. I, um, I'm afraid of heights all of a sudden where I used to not, I've skydived twice, you know, when I was in my twenties. And now I remember we went to camp with my daughters and they wanted me to jump off this diving board and to, and I, I could not do it. I could not jump off the diving board. I, I developed this fear of heights. I don't know what's going on. So is that the most danger? Because you've ever felt making pretend because I feel like you've put yourself in some, a lot the of- The Word of Faith Fellowship was definitely yeah. the scariest thing. <laughs> I remember right before- and I think I said this in the episode right before I went to go visit the cult leader because I had, you know, she invited me into the church and we were going to have spend the day together. And I remember right before my friend dr dropped me off that my stomach just melted. just went bleh. Yeah. <laughs> And I was just like, oh, my God, I, it's a weird feeling to describe because I, I've only felt it a couple of times, you know, like in roller coasters or, you know, when, when you have that p the feeling in the pit of your stomach. Um, yeah, that was the craziest stuff. And then for criminal conduct, John and I were coming up with ideas for season three, and we were going to go after the Mexican mafia, the same cartel that uh, El Chapo is from. And I was, like, do that. I was like, you know what? No, we don't need to do that. Yeah. Whew. Oh, my God. That would scare me. If, if would have made an awesome season, but that's true. To kind of wrap things up, I, how do you feel about the future of being a podcaster in the year 2022 as an independent podcaster making some of the best audio there is up against these humongous companies that have gigantic budgets? How do you feel? How are your spirits right now? You know, I hope I have another five years in me, another 100 episodes in me, and it might not be pretend. 
you know, it, it might not be criminal conduct. You know, I have ideas of, for other shows, other storytelling shows that are just like really fulfilling. And I would love to do it. If I could do all of it, I would, because all podcasters have like a million ideas for shows, you know, yeah. but I have this one kicking around in my head <gasps> and I would love to keep pretend going, but also, I want to see how I develop as a storyteller. Not that I ran out of pretend ideas. I haven't. But I, there are other stories that I would like to tell that, are, that don't fit this deception category. And, and yeah, I mean, I don't know when that's going to happen. But maybe in the future, there's another medium for me. I feel like you're hinting at something and I'm excited about it. But that's the great thing about podcasting. You can do your, you can do whatever you want. What's your dream for pretend? So my goal is what got me into this in the, to begin with is to make documentaries, not just podcasts. And my dream would be to have like an HBO documentary. That would be awesome. But some of that is already coming true. You know, I've been talking with a lot of production companies about developing some of my episodes for streaming services, you know, and, and that's in the works right now. So, and I, it's, it's so funny because, you know, this, this show, I would have never imagined that, that it would have led to these opportunities, but it's so awesome. It, it, it gives me different ways and different formats to tell my stories. Oh my gosh. Well, you'll have to tell me about it because I will need to write about it for podcast, the newsletter, but oh, that's yeah, really awesome. exciting. And you deserve all the things you make something beautiful that so many people enjoy. So thank you so much. And thank you for letting me be on your show. I well, But I feel like all we did was talk about me. So tell me, <laughs> tell my listeners, I know we started talking about your newsletter, but please tell them like where to find it and, and what it's all about. I mean, go ahead. I have a podcast discovery newsletter called podcast the newsletter you can find it at podcastnewsletter.substack.com or you can just find me at lauren passell on twitter l-a-u-r-e-n-p-a-s-s-e-l-l all my stuff is there but this was a real, it. this was a real treat because i listen to your voice all the time and it was <laughs> really magical to get to have a conversation with you so thank that you is for so weird it. you got to see the wizard you know yes <laughs> well, Lauren, I really do appreciate it. That's awesome. This was a blast. And awesome. I'm so excited. Will, will you do the 200th episode? Absolutely. I'll be here. <laughs> Call me. Okay. okay. Awesome. Hey, thanks a lot. Creative Babble.